of the Latina Leadership Podcast, the podcast made for Latinas by Latinas, with Angelica Casares, Carolina Arenas, Diana Ruby, Jacqueline Villa Gomez, and Sonia Ramirez. Get comfortable, amiga, and enjoy the conversations. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening in today. My name is Carolina Arenas, and I will be your co-host here at the Latina Leadership Podcast. I am very excited to introduce a, I would say, fun, fun theme guest, <laughs> uh, Miss Carolina Costa. She is a founder and CEO of Tragos Games, a drinking card game that highlights Latino cultural norms and traditions. So, Carolina, welcome. Hi, Carolina. Well, yeah, thank yeah, you yeah, for having me. Throw some of our <laughs> listeners out. You have two Carolinas for today, but it's all good. No, so thank you, you for, can... for, again, uh, being here today and... I guess let's just dive in. I always like to ask, um, where are you from? A little bit about your background, um, both, I guess, personal and, and educational, because I think a lot of, of things from your past are connected to uh, your career trajectory thus, thus far. So, Yeah, uh, absolutely, it does. And if you want, you could call me Caro throughout, just to, okay, you know, there just you go. to differentiate right. <laughs> us. <laughs> um, okay, so I... I'm from Queens, New York, born and raised. My mom is Colombian. My dad is Dominican. They met in New York and had our family here. Um, I would say I'm like an honorary Cuban too, because my stepdad, who's like my second dad, um, raised raised me for most of my life too. So I'd say there's a little bit of that in there too. I mean, that combination, those three, <laughs> be careful. I know, Candela. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I, I grew up, or even to this day, I tell people that combination, at least like Colombian, Dominican, and everyone reacts the same way, but I'm like the complete opposite of what you would think mm -hmm. a Colombian, Dominican woman is. Like, I'm just so <laughs> calm and chill and like, Wusa, like just that's just my personality. I don't even like smoke weed or anything. <laughs> I just, I'm just very like chill. Um, so, no, uh, I guess I, I don't really have a lot of the stereotypes, but I do feel like because of my background, um, I feel empowered in a way, you know, and that's like through through this journey that I've gone on, um, learning what it is to be Latina. And because I didn't really fit that mold, you know, my mom is very like spicy, very like sexy. She always wanted her her earrings in her hair up a lot of perfume nice beautiful tight clothes and I was always like almost a tomboy growing mm -hmm. up so I always felt like I didn't really fit that description and I felt kind of like a fraud even saying that I was Latina um, until I grew up and realized just how many different types of us is out there mm -hmm. um, so going back to like that childhood I um, I grew up very much like that, but in a very Hispanic neighborhood. Um, it was like we were just talking about in Jackson yeah. Heights in Queens. And growing up, I, I had a lot of friends of different backgrounds, which I think also tied into like this open mindedness I had um, just living in New York um, and seeing just how many different types of people and cultures there were all around me. Um, that I felt kind of like a citizen of the world more so than Colombian or Dominican. And then I I always studied art. So I think that was a big part of my identity too. And I went to an art high school in Astoria. I went to Frank Sinatra High School. And that's where I learned, you know, all about fine arts and realized like, okay, this is what I thrive in and this is what I want to do with my life. And Somehow my parents were on board. I think they saw the talent from an early age and were like, if you can make this a career, then go for it. They were never, they never tried to put me in a box that was like, you know, you have to be a doctor or do something that will for sure make money. And you're first generation, like, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was surprising, I guess, over time you would, you see the, the pressures from other families, but I never really felt that with mine. Besides just like the need to make money and like mm -hmm. improve our generational wealth. <laughs> and uh, from from the art high school, I went to Parsons in Manhattan. And there I studied communication design, where I learned everything related to graphic design, 
um, illustration. There was some fine arts in there. And I realized that the way the world was going, I would for sure have a career in design. So that's what I definitely focused on. So by the time I graduated, I was looking for a junior graphic design position, which I ended up having. And so it was all going according to plan Mm -hmm. um, up until when I started my business. <laughs> so now when well, there's a lot in there, <laughs> I feel like I need to share. So before recording, like I, I was telling Caro, I too was raised in Queens. Um, and like she said, I always described it as the United Nations. Like I think we had our own bubble where we were raised with so many just background languages, diversity. I mean, Queen, Queens is what the most diverse county, I believe in, in the U S or in New York, it's a borough. Um, but with that being said, th- did that influence your career path or things that you did in choosing a career? I think it had to in a way because I saw everybody doing something different. And even my my family, you know, they were trying out different jobs from when they had first come to, to the area. My mom had come from Colombia when she was 12. Um, oh, wow. And she, she went straight to, she went straight to Montreal, which is where my family had kind of like just settled in. Um, Cause she was the last of five siblings. And so they were all a little settled in there. She moved there with, with her mom and, and the second youngest, um, sibling and they kind of formed a life but once she was in new york she tried to do everything she tried to do housekeeping she tried to work at gas stations. she was at dunkin donuts she was in uh all types of jobs and ended up uh in a career in a uh, dental uh, dental assistant tree no there's <laughs> she ended up being a dental assistant mm-hmm. um and so i think that was you know her just like exploring like what she wanted to do and my dad similarly had various jobs, ended up doing trucking, um, moving from New York to Florida. But it was there was never like a set um, like, hey, you have to do this because themselves and those around them were all trying to just make it. So they're like, however you think that you can make it, go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think just art was something I was born with in a way, like something I always liked doing, you know, from when kids start drawing up until like, when they ask you like, what do you want to be when you grow up when you're in like kindergarten or first grade? I always said, I want to be an artist. <laughs> so, so so then after graduating and stuff, like what, what was your career thought or what was your ideal job that you were like, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to start applying for. Yeah. So then my education really took a part in like, well, what can you do with art? Um, in high school, my art teacher would say, guys, you know, not everyone can be a fine artist. So like, think about other things you would like to do. Do you want to get into animation, movies? Uh, Do you want to do uh, graphic design, work in corporate, work with startups? And these were all foreign ideas to me. It was only uh, trying out different electives in college that I absolutely loved working in um, physical products. And it wasn't very often that we would make physical products, nothing like games, for example. But we did work on like printouts and posters and and books. There was this bookmaking class that I really loved. And this was my last year of school too. And I remember thinking, God, why do I have to love something that probably isn't going to be like a real job? Like or make money. <laughs> where can I, or make money, basically. Yeah. Like where can I go make books and make a living? Mm-hmm. Uh, just because the world just felt so digital at that point uh, already. And this was a uh, 2015. Oh, yeah. Um, so fast paced. Things were changing. Yeah. Drastically. Yeah. So even my thesis, I would have loved to have made this giant book or something. And I ended up making this website, um, which I had no business doing because I'm <laughs> terrible at code. <laughs> um, but it's funny how life turns out that way. Because after college, I, I did get a job right away after graduating. Uh, from a friend who recommended me for this position she was leaving. And it was for a startup that worked with startups in a way. So they were a design agency that helped um, growing tech tech, uh, startups work on their um, 
on their pitch decks for investors, work on their branding, their logo. And these were things I had learned in school. So I just applied it and started off very junior. And over four years, I really developed as a almost senior graphic designer. So in my head, I thought, okay, well, this is definitely paying the bills. I can totally see myself becoming an art director and working my way up, changing maybe companies to a bigger one. So that's where I thought I was going. Okay. And I asked that because like I said, there's a lot of things in our, I guess, past experiences or, or schooling that leads you sometimes to places that you didn't think you were going to be at. Right. So I guess that's, that's where I'm trying to head at. Right. So you're graphic designer, you were raised in, in an area and with a family that, you know, had an open mind to, to tell you, okay, try everything that you can to see, where where you fit or what is it that you're passionate about so when does that light bulb go on that you say oh snap i want to start a game or a board game you know like how how, like where does that transition happen (laughs) after working as a you know graphic designer (laughs) yeah that was it wasn't an obvious transition i i think um you know if you ever like read those adventure books where it's like uh do you want to do this or do you want to change your mind, totally jump to this page uh-huh. or something like that? I, I did something like that where I saw where my life was going and it's not like I wanted to completely change it, but after four years at the agency, I felt very burnt out. I felt like I was doing way too much, um, way more than anyone there. And I didn't feel like quitting because at that point I really enjoyed the stability I didn't want to necessarily leave or quit or look for something else, but I knew I wanted to travel. So this opportunity to travel abroad for four months came to me um, through this through this program. It was called Remote Year. And I thought, you know, what a great way to like shake things up. I get to travel. I get to go to Latin America. The itinerary was for four different cities in Latin America at the time. Yeah. And it was a way for me to also reconnect with a culture I didn't feel really too connected to at that point and something I almost felt self-conscious of. Um, So I thought, you know, it's a great way to like switch up work because I still get to work uh, doing this program. Um, But then I also get to like experience something totally new. And at this point, I had also not really ever left New York in a way. So it was just it felt like like a calling to me. Mm And even though everybody thought I was crazy, they're like, why are you trying to leave like the best city in the world? And like, no, there's more. Um, <laughs> there's more. I out know, there. there's, yeah. We love New York, but there's more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at this point, I was 24, 25. So I was like, well, why not? Yeah, that's you know, the best that time. Was, nothing holding yeah, me back. <laughs> I was single, I didn't have kids. So, like, I, I still don't have kids. <laughs> but um, yeah, why not? So that's where the the journey to kind of like um, figuring out who I was, um, experiencing my culture in a way I never had before. These were all things I learned on this trip. I also met um, a friend who was traveling on the same program who introduced me later on, once we were back home and everything, later on to this idea. And because he was doing marketing and I was doing design, we just felt like very like naturally compelled to work together in this way. Um, in addition to being good friends and having this experience that we now shared uh, to to create this game. And the the game idea came from him wanting to kind of explore a cultural drinking game. Um, and, you know, we had already partied together. We had already like tested it bonded out. over. Yeah, yeah. Like like um, just like had so many e- ethnic uh, similarities that I immediately understood where he was going with it. And I thought, why doesn't this exist already? And we looked it up, there was nothing like it. And I, and I felt like this was a great way to kind of preserve that cultural reconnection that I had had myself with my culture um, into a game that I could then play back home, even though I was still speaking English back home or wasn't speaking as much Spanish, or even though the culture wasn't all around me, I would at least have this game to tie it all in and, and make it fun. So jumped on the opportunity to work with him on this. And we both built out our brands together 
Um, he did the, the an Asian American version, and I did the oh, nice. Latino American version. Yeah, called well, not tragos. So, yeah, that's that was the start, and it was very random. It was just like a side project. Mm-hmm. Never did I think I'm going to stop doing everything I'm doing and start my own business. That was never the plan. <laughs> and then, how did you come up with the name? Like, what triggered you to choose uh, that name? Yeah. I mean, I, I look back at that time and it, it feels very long ago now. Um, so I'm trying to think like who I mean, it's amazing. Me. It's, per- it's perfect. <laughs> it's, it's short, sweet, get to the point. I, it's, it, it works. Yeah. <laughs> From a marketing perspective, it works. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I definitely agree. So I think I'm going to owe this to um, one of my friends from high school. And I'm only saying this because she texted me the other day and saying, I hope you know that this was my idea and you should give me all the credit. <laughs> I was like, wait, what do you mean? She's like, you sent me a list of names and I immediately picked Dragos and told you never to look at the other ones again because I told you that it needed to be no more than two syllables. It was short. It made like, you know, it, it got English the point across. English and Spanish, you could, it makes sense in both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she swears that she was the one who really convinced me because I think another name on the list was probably like, Latino flow, which that <laughs> reggaeton song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not again. That's more like reggaeton song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. But that's good, though. I mean, like I said, I, I, the name it sticks. Um, for those that don't know, tragos means a drink in translation, right? Um, yep. and I, I believe that although it's a drinking game, everybody can tweak it. You know, you can play with water, cafecito if you want. (laughs) It doesn't have to specifically be played um, with alcohol. Um, But what does the game involve? That's another thing. For those that haven't um, gone to purchase it, because I know where I can find it. (laughs) But what what does it entail? Like, what is the game about? Yeah. So, I mean, Tragos is so easy to play. I say you can learn in 20 seconds. So it's a stack of cards and they all have a prompt on them. So you just pick up a card on your turn and it will tell you exactly what to do. Sometimes it'll be like, if this is true about you, then take a sip of anything. Like Mm -hmm. you said, it doesn't have to be alcohol. Um, Other times it'll be a challenge card, like do this dare or take a sip um, or dare somebody to do it um, or answer a trivia question. So there's different, many different categories to make it different per turn. Uh, but they all relate to the Latino culture. And then how did you have any tools or any mentors to help you create this game? Because I, I, I believe, again, I, I'm not, I don't have a background in, in any games or in the toy industry, but I'm assuming that it's a hard place to be in or even a hard place to enter, right, as a business owner or as a Latina entrepreneur that's that's going into this category of product in, in business. So did you have anyone help you, guide you with all of that? Yeah. Um, honestly, I would, I would give a lot of credit to John Lim, who's the friend who created the Asian version of Tragos. I always mention him because without the random call that one day he yeah. mentioned the idea, yeah, it would, it would have never happened. Uh, And because I helped him develop his branding and his uh, design first, he was always like one month ahead of me. So by the time I would get to a certain part of the business, like, how do I send out orders? How do I get the printers to like start the or, you know, all these things, he would kind of guide me and be like, okay, all you got to do is this or that. And then the rest was a lot of Googling. And at that point, I honestly didn't have too many people to turn to because I didn't know anyone in games and it I don't know if it's just like my personality something I got to work on where it's like I feel like I can do it I can do it um I can figure it out and so if it wasn't asking him or somebody really close by a random question then it was just me like googling Mm -hmm. finding out things on my own um so I would say google had a really big part (laughs) and then um I think over time, I've met a lot of people, people in toys and games, people in the Latina leadership space. And 
I wouldn't say I have found one true mentor, to be honest, but just a very large community that I've worked to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just stay connected. And I think that's been a really hard part for me. I'm not I'm not a networker. I'm not very social, um, very much like to myself, but um, in like the in the role that I've created for myself is something that I feel like you have to do. You have to network and market and, you know, be your brand at all times. So something I'm still working on. So then fast forwarding now to 2023, and now that you have been involved for so long in that industry, is there an advice that you have for for Latinas that are coming into this industry? Like, hey, yes, Google is, is, is great, um, but maybe this platform is better or educate yourself yeah. more on X, Y, and Z in creating. Cause, cause I have heard there's a lot of people that have ideas with, with games and toys, but it's getting that right foot in the right, you know, what is it? Your foot in the right door or speaking to that person right. that's going to, you know, help you out. If it, it, you have any advice that that's, I guess that's my yeah. question. Yes. Uh, so now where I am, I am part of a couple of, networks and communities. One big one that I feel like has been so helpful in the last year and a half has been women in toys. So any oh, yeah. women in general looking to be in the toys and game space, they've, they're have they just a really big nationwide community. Um, it's a membership, a, a yearly membership that's worth it because it's just women doing all types of things. They work in like plush toys, puzzles, games, um, all ages um, of types of toys from like toddler to adult. And Women in Toys is involved with trade shows. They have networking events. They have people in the community that you can connect with to um, kind of introduce you to certain people. So I think that's a big one. And then... um, as far as Latinos goes, we um, have friends at Alpha, A-L-P-F-A. Um, I think the, so it's a long one. The, That's okay. it's we like can, Latino, we can find like, it and share it after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like Latino professionals, and they're also a nationwide um, uh, community. So, yeah, we've talked to a lot of people, and I think just um, anyone that you can – connect with. I think LinkedIn is a really great um, opportunity, something that I'm, I'm still trying to w- use LinkedIn, which is I don't, I don't post often. There's but so many platforms nowadays. I think that's the problem that we need to narrow it down. There's too much social media, <laughs> but they're no, working yeah. if you use correctly. They are. They, they work. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say LinkedIn to find those communities because those networking groups, that's where you want to be. You don't want to be randomly posting on LinkedIn without having the right people looking at it or, and vice versa. So I'd say use LinkedIn for that networking. We're very like um, strong in like the social media, like n- community that we build. So one thing that I've done a lot this year is try to like make close friends in certain areas. Like we have our New York friends, we have our Houston friends, like, Yay. and these are people that are not just like, social media friends these are people that we have met in person Mm -hmm. that we know like who their kids are like what they're doing in life and so that feels it i feel way more like close-knit now than i used to and it it doesn't feel like i have to do everything alone yeah and that's amazing that's something i love too about um following up on 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 social media with you guys that you have hired or kept friends within the company um, so I, f- I feel like that's also a sense of, of not relief, but that you guys are all on the same page, right? That you, you have this mission. Um, so I guess with that also, have you had any hardship when it comes to your business growth? So I know you've grown really fast. I feel that of it. <laughs> yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. She's that like, oh, she's that target. Mm-hmm. Woo. You know, like you see <laughs> that part, but they don't see like the struggle behind it. So how do I narrow it down? I guess my question is, have you experienced hardship in growing your business? And if so, how did that look like for you? And how did you manage it? Yeah, it's a, it's an important question. 
I just never know where to start because it's, I feel like it's, it's been like several years of hardship, I would say. Mm -hmm. Definitely a roller coaster. And you're not wrong. We did grow very fast. And I think that was part of why we had so much hardship because normally you have like a business trajectory where you start off small and you don't expect to pay yourself within like the first or second year. And you have all these expectations of how you see the business growing. Well, we had like a flipped um, like scenario, oh, yeah. like situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where the first year we had gone viral on social media, everybody was talking about us. We went from like small side gig project into actual business, tens of thousands of units of inventory that we were managing from like our apartment, well, my apartment in New York. And so it was just like, okay, all hands on deck. I don't know anyone. So I'm just going to bring my closest friends and we're just going to do this. (laughs) And it doesn't work long term. Um, And I was slow to understand all the things that you really need to run a successful business. I think the only part I got right was creating a product that had a right market fit for the right audience at the right time, I guess. Uh, But after that, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what to do with my money. I didn't know how to scale on social. I was throwing everything away on Facebook ads. Um, I was hiring like, I love them, but like not as experienced people as I should have Mm -hmm. for where we were going. Um, And I wasn't firing enough, which it's painful to say out loud because I worked with a lot of friends. Um, But in those years where we were struggling to understand our costs, our projections, our expenses, I couldn't let go of this idea that I was kind of failing as a leader because we weren't doing the best possible work as a team. So I didn't put it on anyone else but myself. And so the only thing I really did was cut back on hours, even though we were losing money every day. But I I just didn't know how to stop the bleeding so Mm -hmm. like as quickly as I should have. So even now, I feel like we're just kind of settling in to a pace where we could call ourselves, um, you know, a steady business. But for two years, it just felt like maybe um, outward, it looked like we were still trying to be as as big as people could imagine us to be. Uh, But it just really wasn't the case. Uh, It was a lot of like fires uh, going on in the background that I'll openly like talk about now. I don't know if I was trying to hide it back then as much as just trying to keep the lights on and like Mm -hmm. stay positive. So I would say definitely a lot of hardships, but if there's one advice I could give off of all of that, that I experience is really know your numbers and understand. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I know it's like such a common like tip, but it's something that people forget because you get like so wrapped up in like the creative, but you really need someone to say, no, you can't spend on that. No, you can't hire that person. No, that person can't get a raise. No, you can't pay yourself yet. So that is where we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's those are things that need to be talked about and reminding business owners that there's certain things that if you don't pay attention to them now, right, it's it can blow up in your face later on. And then it hurts the business that either is growing like yours is or you lose the opportunity in the business that could have grown because you didn't do the things the right way. Um, but yeah, I completely understand. <laughs> and and I, I feel like a lot of listeners are going to be like, oh, man, my numbers. <laughs> Nobody likes it. I mean, I don't like math, so. I don't like numbers. Like, oh, I think I most care. entrepreneurs don't like numbers yeah. um, unless you become so good at it that you're like, oh, okay, I'm mm-hmm. good at numbers. But no, I But then I like you said, right, the importance of it. learning how to delegate. Once you're able to do that, you as the business owner, you need to focus on the business and let the experts like your marketing team, your CPA, let them do what they, what they know how to do. Right. Um, But something that, again, I admire from you is that you've used your background, your heritage in creating um, this business has, well, what is the positive or what is the, like, what is the highlight awesomeness of using your Latino background in this product? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question and reminder. <laughs> um, yeah, I would definitely say that at the end of the day, I do make games for a living. Okay. <laughs> so okay, there's more than fun. one. It's not just tragos, right? There's more. It's okay. Yes, I mean, we'll there stick are. with tragos right and, now, pero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll bring up the other one too because it's Hispanic Heritage Month and uh, we are just now in target with this one. Limited run, but we'll get there. Um, so yeah, aside from just making games, um, that is fun. I think it's funny, you know, like whenever I'm developing new Tragos cards, I'm just like laughing to myself, you know, <laughs> just or looking up inspiration and just coming up with ridiculous ways to say certain things or or coming up with the dare cards, which are also ridiculous. But I think the number one thing that I love, love, love about my job, I guess, is connecting with other people, of course. Just seeing the way that somebody from Honduras or Salvador or, or Argentina, like having them like read some Tragos cards and being like, you get me, mm-hmm. is... A crazy feeling because one coming from someone that never felt Latina enough and two coming from someone that doesn't really know you know the Argentinian culture or the Salvadorian culture you know like that there is like a beauty to having our individual cultures of course but there's something even more beautiful about everything that we have in common oh yeah which I think it makes it fun it makes it like a way to bond and uh, feel closer to someone. So that's that's my favorite part. Whenever someone's like, oh, this is so funny, my mom does this, or even just seeing like us tagged and a game night full of a bunch of different people mm-hmm. being like, oh my God, yeah, there I go. Like, like, ah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's crazy to feel like you've done something that has become way bigger than you. That's just an incredible feeling that Again, I never thought I would go in this direction. So I feel like really blessed, grateful to to be able to do something so fun and like make other people like in, experience like fun memories. No, and again, I'm I'm a, a big fan. Again, I love and any any product that has heritage behind it, regardless of where it's from, I I admire. But I even admire even more when there's like a social um, component to it. And I know that you you participate or you also do things right like socially to give back to the community what are some things that you have done thus far yeah i mean that's something i would love to keep doing like i said those rough years we kind of had to pause on that but um since we started i think it was our second expansion pack this was for mitiera we kind of did like a a give back so with every um with every Mitierra expansion pack that we sold, we would give a portion, uh, a percentage of the proceeds to an educational um, nonprofit that focused on, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it was called Dreamers Map, if I'm not mistaken. And basically all the organizations that we've tried to work with support Latino communities, either in the US, in Latin America, and they revolve around education, housing, um, for a time COVID relief, um, disaster relief. Like so, it's all like timely. But you know, in general, I think my two big things that I would love to continue supporting is education and housing, just because I've seen how much it truly affects like our community. For myself, like, and seeing you know how much necessity there is especially in latin america with homes and neighborhoods for people who don't even have like a house or or clean water Mm -hmm. yeah i've seen that firsthand just you know while we were traveling we had those days where we would um do community work and so that really like always always reminds me that we're not just like latino we're not just fun we're not uh we're, we're just so like such a multifaceted culture and like uh demographic that spans across like jo- like mainly these two continents that there's so much work to be done there and i would love to continue doing that work uh with with my business and future businesses well yeah and you do that too just with the game like just bring like you said bringing that game to like a party or you know to a college dorm you you mm-hmm. educate 
the people that you're playing the game with. I mean, it's in a fun way. And yeah, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're doing an edu- there's educational components there, I think. And then that sparks conversations, right? Of like, oh, where are you from? What are you yeah. doing? Or like, your mom did that too. Oh, my dad did that. So I, again, <laughs> I love it. And, and I'm just, I'm thankful that, that, that idea, you know, has grown to where it is. Um, but with positive stuff, there's also negative things, right? Have you mm-hmm. gone through any, I guess, bias or issues with it being a drinking game, tragos, you know, unfortunately, mm-hmm. there's a lot of stereotype in our communities, right, of alcoholism and all that yeah. stuff. Um, have you encountered anything like that or? Um, so I think from the get go, we've always been clear, like you can play with any drink mm-hmm. and I'll be honest, like in the very beginning, I was like, but will people play? Like, would I play with like, you know, Girl, just, did like, you play beer bong? Have you played beer bong <laughs> at least once in your lifetime? <laughs> I mean, don't play yeah, a card game. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Like I, I had my college years, you know, I was definitely like playing these games um, at the time. I was like drinking, like once I turned 21, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say now that I'm a little older, I definitely see the fun in the game without alcohol because sometimes I didn't even want to play tragos with my friends or family, whoever recommended like, oh, guys, let's play tragos. I'm like, guys, I'm not trying to have that kind of night. Like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) but but now like it's like, okay, you know what? It still is funny because there's different cards that make you do things and everybody's laughing, like not because they're drunk, but because like the cards are actually Mm -hmm. funny and like are like we have so many inside jokes like amongst the friends and family and I'll play with like a beer a, a juice or like now with like tea there you go, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah cuz you know we're we're getting to that age I can't I can't do that you can't often hang anymore, but I I can't really hang anymore nope. it has to be a whole thing need the day off the next day it's a whole thing but yeah that's why I actually um I think it's a good segue to talk about the other game real quick. Yes. No, let's go for it. That's what I'm saying. It's not just struggles. You can do a lot more. So, Yeah. So um, because we're getting to that age, I think it it all goes downhill once you turn 27. 27. Um, (laughs) I know. I don't know. Like for me, 27 was when I started like waking up with aches. I'm like, God. Um, But just like that idea of like not wanting to drink all the time. It's like, okay, well, we need more games for the community, but isn't just drinking because Mm -hmm. like you said, not everybody drinks. And we have a lot of kids in our family that would always want to play tragos, but not because of the drinking, but because more like the language is a little older. Mm -hmm. You, it's not the best game. We say ages 18 and up for tragos. So we wanted to make a game for the kids, for the people who don't drink. And so we came up with Get Loud. So Get Loud is a, the first bilingual game um, in our in our like product line that had English and Spanish. And it's a guessing game that you play kind of like heads up or taboo. Oh. Um, so you have your team guess as many words as possible. You have a minute with a timer and you just describe the word like, okay, if I'm describing the word duck or pato, it's like, okay, it's a bird. It says quack quack or like, you know, and if you're playing with like your abuela or like a tia doesn't speak English, but like with a kid who doesn't speak Spanish, then they can guess in either language. And so it's, um, it's bridging like that, mm-hmm. that gap between bilingual or like English um, world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that like multi generational family. So and that's something that you know, I didn't grow up with that. I never played games with my parents besides, mm-hmm. you know, like playing cards, because the language was always like a barrier for me or them. Or dominoes, but yeah, no. Or yeah, dominoes, yeah. Really, yeah not a lot, a lot. Of Maybe games. Uno. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, are there any other uh, games then, or are those the two that you have? So, so Get Loud was the first like family friendly game we came out with. Those two are now in Target. Get Loud is there for Hispanic Heritage Month, so it's, um, I think, in not every store, um, but Dragos is. You can find both of them um, on the Target website. Mm -hmm. So if you want to like look if your location has them. But those two are our like main brands, I would say. And then we have a few more games. We have another Tragos game that we want to 
release as well just to have like more variation like continue the like the collection and then we also have this mystery game <laughs> that i can't say anymore like it's that's so it. it's, it's so in production yeah that's follow. that's it yeah <laughs> and actually where so, can everybody follow you or you said we can find it we can find the game at target which by the way i went yes and i'm happy to tell you that it was on an aisle and it was on the what is it eye level rack which is yes. important for sales <laughs> It really is. I mean, they hooked us up. I was like, oh, no, I was scared that we we're going to be like at the very bottom. No, but it no, that's good. like perfect. Uh-huh. So they yeah. can find you at Target. Where else? Yes, um, we, we're at Target. Um, we have our other we have Get Loud and the English and or Spanish version of Tragos on Amazon. Um, for the Target game, we evolved the game to be English and Spanish. So now. Um, the front is English, the back is Spanish, um, but we have the other original products on Amazon, on our website, um, tragosgame.com. Um, we're on walmart.com mm-hmm. and that's pretty much it. But yeah, I would say go to Target guys, cause, uh, it'll really help with, um, that second order, which is so important for every, you know, like, like small business brand to stay on those shelves. And then those, those, and I guess this is a, a question from the beginning, but getting yourself at Target and Walmart is a big deal. Was that, was that something that was difficult for you to do that they look for you or is there again, advice for upcoming businesses that, you know, you, you would let them know like, Hey, this is something that you should do if, if you're looking into being in this, you know, these brick and mortar stores. Yeah. So it's kind of tough because someone from Target reached out to us. Um, and this was about two years ago. So I would say we, it, it's all about like, I guess, finding whoever will listen mm-hmm. within the department that you're tackling. And I think the best way to do that would be to either work with a distributor um, that is a company that's kind of the middleman between you and the big box stores. And that distributor knows about your industry. They know what Target is looking for, and then they can help set up those meetings. If you're trying to do it on your own, they might tell you to find a distributor anyway, how yeah. they told us, because if you're a small business fulfilling out of your basement or garage, they're going to be like, there's no way you can give us what we're looking for. There's, you need like, you know, third party logistics and things like that. Yeah, you can meet orders. Um, Right. Um, So I would say uh, to find the right people, if not through like distributor, all these people, I would say, look for them at trade shows, Um, look for them through the organizations that I mentioned, like Women in Toys. Um, These are all people that we met um, or, well, the person who reached out was through email, but everyone else that we've met have been through trade show attendance um, or or just like those networking groups. And then once that kind of all happened, we're talking to the right people, it's just a matter of having your story straight. Do you have a pitch? Do you have your sales uh, numbers? What makes you stand out? Like, what do you think will make you beat out your competition? And so I think what was special for us that we always believed in was, okay, well, we've done well through e-commerce. There's not really anyone like us on the market. And so I think that's what helped us kind of like fast forward because I know other businesses have struggled, you know, to, to kind of get to where you are. And for me, I thought, oh God, we're taking forever to get into a, a into a store. And now everyone's like, you're moving like really fast, like chill out. <laughs> so grateful for, for where we are. Right yeah. Now. To, again, so where can all of our listeners find you? Um, like social media or again, stores as well. Well, stores you let us know, but yeah, social media, if they wanted to follow the business or yourself. Yeah, we we mainly post on Instagram and TikTok. That's where we post all our stories, journeys um, at Dragos Game. Um, that's yeah, that that's the main one that has our link in bio where you could find everything about us. Um, and 
yeah, it'll really appreciate a follow. <laughs> yeah. And then to close out, we always like to ask our guests, um, do you consider yourself a leader? So I would say yes, in a sense. I consider myself a leader in kind of the space that I'm opening up um, for BIPOC game makers. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity to keep coming out with more toys and games that are more representative of so many different types of communities and cultures. So I would say I feel like I'm part of like the pioneering team that's moving this forward. And I hope that in the next five, 10 years, we have a ton more games um, that you would call like cultural on the shelves. As far as a team leader or, you know, just a leader of my own uh, within my own business, it's kind of tough because I've, I've had a team. It's been very difficult um, working alone and, and remote. Uh, I feel like I still need another chance to prove myself as a leader um, to help like employees or, you know, team leaders or team members grow one day. So I think that's where I would love to have the opportunity as I grow to, to be that type of leader, which um, I still have like some work to do. I'm a fan. So if you didn't notice that, <laughs> I'm letting you know. Um, but no, so everybody listening in, we want to thank you. And again, Tragos is up for sale at Target, Walmart, and with Hispanic Heritage Month right around the corner, um, we hope that you guys can go out and support. But yeah, so Carolina Costa, thank you so much. Thank you. What did you think of the conversation? If you enjoyed what you heard, let us know in the comments. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Thank you for listening to the Latina Leadership Podcast, and we will see you next time.